The problem is there are more people called Dave in fund management than there are women. So we can't quote women in markets who don't exist. This is The Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times. It's hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This second series is about all the aspects the FT organization is covering today, from editorial to development, from data to talent. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is a guide we designed to inspire you to be the one driving innovation and change. Welcome to the show. And here we go, episode 39 of the Talent Show here at One Friday Street uh, in London, our Financial Times headquarters in the podcast studio. And today I'm joined by Katie Martin, the markets editor and writer of the Long View column here at the Financial Times. How are you, Katie? I'm good. How are you? Very happy to be at the same table with one of the voices that I hear on markets every morning. But today, as you know, the talent show and as our listeners know, is more about the career paths and journeys of our experts and specifically our journalists. So, Kitty, I'd love to know more about you and your career path and what made you so passionate about markets. So it really started off with being passionate about journalism. Um So I always wanted to be a journalist. I saw, you know, in the Superman movies, there was Lois Lane and she had like really cool outfits and a nice typewriter and yes. she worked in a newsroom and I was just immediately like, that is definitely what I want to do. I want to be Lois Lane. She looks pretty cool. Um, but it always felt like something that um, I never imagined that I would actually be able to do it in the sense that I came from a background that was you know, in, in like farming effectively. And um, I didn't know any journalists. I didn't know anybody who knew any other journalists. It was something that was completely alien to me and I always assumed would be a space that I would never be able to, to crack into. Um, so it was something that I always wanted to do but never thought that I would be able to. Um, but I guess I, I stuck with it. I, uh, I went off to, uh, to university, studied Russian toyed with being a spy, obviously, because that's what you do when you've got a degree in Russian, um, and eventually decided that um, I wanted to tell secrets, not keep secrets, so I went into journalism instead. It's a very interesting way uh, to see this, especially when it comes to the behind the scenes of a corporate world and markets. How does your day look like? It, it sounds like you need to keep up with a quite fast-paced market and industry that is the one of uh, the financial markets. Um, yeah, the difficult and joyful thing, honestly, about markets is that it, it depends on everything, right? So there's a, there's a lot of beats out there where you have quite a sort of a narrow field, a fixed set of people that you need to know, and then you're kind of in the know. Markets, you need to kind of keep across all sorts of different things all at the same time. You need to kind of be watching the economic data as it comes out. You need to be keeping on top of who's interesting, who's got an interesting view, why do they see the world like this, why is this other person over here saying that they're completely wrong. So you need to have an eye on geopolitics, you need to have an eye on data, you need to just keep an eye on the screens, right? Because, you know, it, it, sometimes when you look at a screen full of financial data, you have like loads of charts and flashing numbers and it just all looks completely impossible. It's really not. If you know where to look for things, you can kind of get a decent picture of what's going on in the world. The What I do... What I spend the majority of my time on when I'm trying to make sense of markets is talk to investors. So um, bankers, perfectly nice people, at least some of them. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the analysts over on the banking side have a lot of really interesting ways of thinking about the world and guiding your thoughts on how to, um, how to think about uh, all those things we just said, geopolitics, data, economics. Um, but investors are a very useful source of information because they're ultimately they're the people who are pressing the button on what they're going to buy and what they're going to sell and they've got this kind of fabled skin in the game and so they're really an incredibly useful set of people to talk to and, and incredibly generous with their time and their insight on um, helping FT readers to, to understand the world. Meeting and uh, interacting with a lot of uh, visa stakeholders yeah. And then you take the time to research, I guess, by yourself? 
there's a lot of reading analysis, whether that comes from the buy side, which is the investors, or from the sell side, which is the analysts. You've just got to read and read and read and read. And there are some people who, um, you know, some analysts who are just like constantly wrong, but read it anyway, because you need to understand why it is that your set of kind of assumptions about what's going on with the US economy or what's going on with inflation or whatever it is, where could I be wrong? So it's really important to kind of spread your net widely and read as many different people as you can, but also to try and retain that sense and and really to remember nobody knows. So there's this there's this kind of idea out there that there are some kind of markets geniuses, whether they're investors or, or bankers or whoever it is, that have really, they know what's going to happen next. The big secret of markets reporting is that nobody knows what's going to happen next and everybody's opinion is equally as valid as everybody else's. What would be your uh, best tip for your younger self in a being prepared to work in a newsroom today? Um, my best tip is I think if you want to go into journalism, always be prepared to ask the stupid question. And people are generally very forthcoming and also actually you end up tapping into a way of thinking about something that hadn't come up before. And actually also sometimes these, you know, experts, these people who are supposed to, you know, these masters of the universe in markets who definitely know what's going to happen next, sometimes it's quite disarming if you ask them a really basic question and they have to stop and think, hang on, why, why do I think that? Why, why is this necessarily true? Always try and connect the dots. So if you can see something funny that's going on in one particular market, whether it's the currencies market or the bonds market or, or, or whatever it is, just try and think how this links up to, to other stuff. See if there's a bigger story there that, that you're missing. You know, see if you know, there's a really large move in one particular stock or one particular currency or whatever it is. I think, really, why has this happened? Has, has somebody messed something up? Has, uh, has a data system gone mad somewhere? That's where some of the kind of really fun stories lie, if you just push that tiny bit further. From Russian, then moving to markets, what made you decide to go into this uh, uh, topic? So um, I initially, I, I did some kind of internships and stuff straight out of university. I worked for some local newspapers for a little while because I did Russian. I lived in Russia back in the days when, when students could go and live in, in Russia when they were doing, you know, studying the language. And I did an internship at CNN out there and just had like a, a brilliant time. It was a blast. When it came to getting into journalism in the UK, the jobs I ended up going for were in bits of journalism that a lot of other people weren't interested in. So that's around kind of finance and markets. And so I guess I got into that like about 25 years ago. And you just stick with it, right? Because all of a sudden having any kind of markets knowledge or at least not being frightened of it becomes a really marketable skill. And so I went from the specialist trade press into Dow Jones Newswires, which was great. And I feel like Newswire training is absolutely invaluable, makes you work at speed. <laughs> and that's a really good discipline to have. Um, and then sort of branched out from there into, into newspapers. And actually, the, the longer you cover markets, the longer you think about markets and try and dig out stories on markets, the more you realise, actually, it's not just about the flashing numbers on the screen. It's about the people behind it. And so every time there's a big market move, there's someone making a load of money off it. There's someone losing a load of money off it. There's someone making huge mistakes. There's someone getting incredibly lucky. And that's where the kind of really fun stories lie, when you just remember there is a human somewhere that has done something terrible or something fantastic to make this happen. And that's kind of where some of the more fun elements come in. So what has been the most exciting stories or reporting that you have done until today? So one of the stories that I did recently was a kind of celebration, really, of 50 years of women at the London Stock Exchange. And I went and I, I spoke to some of these women who were in the kind of first cohort to make it onto the stock exchange floor. And they were so proud of what they had done, rightly, for which they'd had almost no recognition up to this point. But... They were, they were pioneers and they did amazing things to get to where they got. And they were treated, by today's standards, pretty 
pretty badly. I mean, there was stuff said to them and stuff that you, in a million years, you wouldn't see anymore. So when they first got onto the exchange floor, there was one of them in particular. It was all in the local newspapers. Oh, you know, pretty, pretty Janet, 22, brunette, with no special boyfriend, has, <laughs> okay. has made her way onto the stock exchange floor. It's like, OK, stuff was different 45 years ago. But the the nice thing about that story was that it was so important to them to be recognised and that they had, you know, despite everything, had such a positive experience out of it. And apparently one of them was on holiday recently, one of these ladies, and someone came up to her and said, are you one of the FT originals? I read about, you know, my mum read about you in the paper and she sent me this story and da-da-da-da-da. And so it's just nice to be able to do something positive and to um, to kind of to help to recognize these women basically it's really important I think to give a voice and uh, tell the stories of uh, people that uh, were there but they didn't have uh, I think the right places and the media maybe they weren't covering these kind of stories compared to, to, to today um, in your role especially at the beginning of your career, uh, being a woman, did you experience anything that you believe and you hope that uh, will never happen today? Broadly speaking, no. I feel like I've always been treated with respect. There was one occasion when I was quite new in this game and I went to visit a brokerage. Rough and tumble environments, let's just say. And this is a good... 20 odd years ago and I do remember the way the room was structured you got out of the lift and you were just there on the floor with all the kind of traders sort of you know shouting at each other and as I say I grew up on a farm fairly used to coarse language I have never heard language like it before or since and it was quite shocking and I do remember as I kind of walked around the edge of the kind of trading floor people's heads were turning it's like my god there's a woman in the room kind of thing this is a long time ago and this is not the sort of behavior that I see now but I do find it kind of just amazing that like I say like I say I speak to a lot of investors I speak to a lot of analysts and we make a really dedicated effort on our desk to quote as many women as we can what we want to do is get to a 50 50 position in terms of the people that are quoted in our stories the problem is there are more people called Dave in fund management than there are women. So we can't quote women in markets who don't exist. And so we have this constant battle to, you know, just just find find interesting women who are, you know, who are willing to talk about whatever it is in markets. And we have made a lot of progress on this front. But again, it's it's all part of the ecosystem. It, it relies on investment firms and banks having women in senior enough positions that they want to talk to the press about whatever it is, interest rate policy, currencies, stock markets, whatever it is. Um, we would love to quote more. If there's anyone out there listening who's in a position to put more women in front of, you know, Zoom calls to talk to FT journalists, we are always happy to do it. Um, but we don't want to do that in a tokenistic way and we don't want to force the situation, but um, it's just something that we would love to do more of. So uh, you have uh, previous experiences in other newspapers. Mm -hmm. You were mentioning about your journey and uh, you were at the Wall Street Journal and then at the Dow Jones and then at the FT. Um, how uh, were your experiences in these big brands and big newspapers different from each other and what you learn from uh, these three big brand names? So when I left the Wall Street Journal eight years ago, I very much expected that I would land at the FT and that it would be kind of basically same job, different accents, right? Just like basically the same thing, but with fewer Americans. And um, I was really wrong about that. You know, um, you know, yes, obviously, it's a much more kind of British environment over, over at the FT, but the whole... Um, the atmosphere is different. The um, the the vibe of the place is different. You know, I, I I loved the Wall Street Journal. I had a great time there. I've still got some friends who are over there. I haven't got a a bad word to say about the place, but it's much more structured. You have much more editors. You have a lot more kind of picking through every word of your copy, and you have just a lot more checking. And look, 
I'm 100% with that. I, you know, that's um, a really important part of the process. But I guess what you see when you come over to the FT is that it's a much flatter structure. It's less hierarchical. You have fewer kind of formal stages of editing and, and checking to go through. So I actually think it's useful to go through the American newsroom experience first because it makes you check and double check and triple check everything you write before you file the copy and not after. <laughs> um, but it is just a very different, it's just a very different experience. And so it, it takes much longer to get certain types of stories through that kind of American system than it does through the through the British system. And also just um, American journalists take themselves really seriously. Like, you know. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's a totally different, um, they have a totally different um, opinion of themselves and are sort of, um, less ready to kind of joke about themselves. Okay. And I think that's just an American workplace thing, but I think it's also an American journalism thing. Um, British journalists are extremely self-deprecating. There's a kind of, um, th there's a jokiness and a, and a light-heartedness that I think you don't see in, in American news environments. And that was quite the sort of informality almost and the kind of ability of even the most junior staff at the FT to kind of raise ideas or raise objections with stories or to um, to kind of come up with their own kind of themes to work on is, uh, is, is just different. It's not necessarily better or worse, it's just different. And um, maybe, uh, Katie, can you pinpoint a moment in your career when you felt that uh, everything changed for you? There was a specific moment, a specific meeting, someone that uh, gave you an opportunity, something that you would like to tell our younger people out there that might be an insightful moment. I was I was thinking about this before uh, before our chat and I was thinking, what, what is the moment where that really kind of made a difference in your career, one of them, and I know it's a kind of really kind of common answer, but one of them was definitely COVID. Mm. Like those instances where, you know, that that's what we're here for. It, like it's one of those moments where you think this is why journalism exists, is to tell people what they need to know about what's happening in the world around them. And my colleagues were doing incredible work on just mapping this health crisis and and talking about the politics and really explaining how the the lockdowns worked our job on markets was to explain to people what is going on and it was quite impressive to see in extremely fraught circumstances everyone everyone at home working off you know shonky little laptops in their kitchens a lot of times struggling to get hold of the right market data to get a sense of what was actually going on but there was that was a real moment of people on you know in all corners of the world just pulling together at all hours to write the stories that really mattered around what was going on and also we were incredibly conscious at that time that cuz markets had quite a moment at that point. Like, they, they really fell out of bed. And um, it was really important to us to be able to explain to everybody why this was happening and why it matters. So, you know, if, if you care about every little tiny up and down in every currency and every stock in the world, you have in front of you a Bloomberg terminal that costs you $2,000 a month to, to do that for you. What we're here to do is to step back a little bit and tell effectively both the specialists and the general public, this this is what's going on and this is why it matters. Um, and um, I like to think that we we did a good we did a good job of that. We certainly um, we pulled together under some fairly trying circumstances, yeah. as everyone did yeah. uh, at that point. The feeling of uncertainty and uh, not being uh, in a predictable space is exactly what you were saying before about markets. I would like just to know, um, this is more from a personal perspective, how you can cover so many different geographies with uh, all the different uh, cultural aspects that interact with how markets act. You just develop spidey senses over a certain period of time. You come to understand, you know, which data releases matter, which ones don't. You know, how how big does a certain surprise have to be on a set of inflation numbers, for example, to act, for actually to move the market? I'm afraid the only way to really do that is kind of through experience and talking to as many people as, as you can. Um, 
And yeah, over, over time, that just builds up a sense of, of what matters and what doesn't. And again, you know, we're, we're, we're the FT. We're not one of the news wires. We don't have hundreds of people covering markets. So you have to be a little bit ruthless and say, OK, we're going to cover this. We're not going to cover that. And that's actually quite a helpful discipline because it really helps you to focus on the stories that that matter um and that's you know part of that is a kind of narration bit right so it's explaining to people this is what's going on in the markets but what kind of the stories that are really satisfying is when we get sort of somewhat under the surface and say okay you think this is what is happening actually this is what's happening and Mm -hmm. so those sorts of little um uh, those sorts of under the bonnet things where you can kind of get you get under the surface and really help people understand what is making markets tick are uh, quite satisfying. Um, what is uh, your tip to younger people that do come uh, from uh, a similar background to yours to really being able to build today your network in a field like markets where you're very passionate about? Like I say, the number one thing is, first of all, Nobody knows what's going on. There is nobody who knows the answer to this stuff. There's a million different interpretations of the same piece of data or whatever it is. So, you know, you should have the kind of confidence of your own convictions. You shouldn't assume that you're the idiot in the room. Um, And secondly, like I say, ask stupid questions and and see what comes out at the other end with with the answer. Um, But just don't be frightened of it. Markets are not scary. I know they look scary. Um, they're, they're really not, you know, I had no economics training. Um, I had no experience in, in finance or markets before I just started doing it. Um, if you've got the right senior people around you, then they will teach you the ropes and then off you go. We all hope for the right mentors and right senior people to, to, guide, uh, to guide you in the process. I have one last question for you, Katie. I would be very interested in understanding if you saw any differences between your ways of doing journalism or approaching uh, the, the news and uh, writing uh, your reporting, etc., compared to younger reporters and younger journalists. Did you see any different methodolo- methodology or would you say that good quality journalism is done in the same exact ways? Everyone's got their own style of doing this stuff. Journalists work very differently to each other. Um, whether people coming through now have a different style, I think, is 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 an interesting question. What I would say to, to anyone looking to get into any sort of journalism is that we see so many people coming through for, for interview or whatever who say, I just love writing and I want to be a writer. That's fantastic. It's at most half of the job because whatever you write some awful horrible editor like me is going to rip it up and start it again and tell you why it was all wrong and then you can hopefully do it better the next time the really important thing is can you extract pieces of information from people that they do not necessarily want to tell you are you a good reporter so finding stuff out is is a massive part of the job i've known some fantastic journalists who cannot write, they could barely write a birthday card, but they are the people who can come up to you and say, hey, so I've just heard this. And you're like, you have? And that's just an incredible story and you can kind of push that through. I've seen lots of people who are very fluid writers but just don't have that rapport with people where they can find stuff out that really matters. So you have to be able to do both. And one of the things that I think is super important is... You know, without wishing to sound like a dreadful old boomer, you know, young people nowadays are frightened of the phone. Pick up the phone. You know, it's a thing on your desk or in your computer somewhere and you have headphones to use it. Just call people up and ask them questions and don't rely over much on email. Um, and yeah, just be prepared to kind of get a bit of a sense of people and where their sense of humor is and, 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 you know, what little avenues you might want to go down in terms of exploring a story, what kind of little winks and nods people give you to kind of give you hints that there might be something you might want to look at over here kind of thing. There's no substitute for getting out there, seeing people and, and hitting the phones. And we always suggested to use the social media in, uh, in, in an efficient way. Uh, but, of course, 
go out, meet people. And uh, I think what you just mentioned about picking up the phone is uh, something that we discussed with uh, other editors, that they saw this difference. And uh, they, they and it is just uh, peculiar to me that the one thing that uh, you all guys notice is this thing about being afraid of speaking on the phone. And I, I, I start actually, I was wondering about this uh, before. I am the first one that I'm not really happy to talk on the phone. I don't know why. Um, you know, PRs don't don't hit the phones like they used to. So people send me like email after yeah. email saying, would you like to meet so-and-so from some investment firm or other? I have like 350,000 unread emails in my, in my inbox. I'm simply not going to see all of these things. If someone just gives me a call and says, do you want to do this, yes or no? This is my other top tip for young journalists is there's a certain, there's always a certain cohort of journalists that really kind of gets a kick out of being rude to PRs. I don't get it. And it's definitely not something that I encourage around people who work with me. But there is this certain, you know, Rather, someone calls you up and says, do you want to meet my client? Rather than just saying, no, go away, I'm busy. Yeah. Just be nice, right? It's nice to be nice, as SpongeBob SquarePants says, right? <laughs> so these people are just doing their jobs. And yes, some of them are kind of trying to flog something into you that's not relevant to your life. But do you know what? You might need some of these people in future. And actually, some of them do help you out with stuff and if you just have a reputation for being fair and at the very least polite just kind of look I just don't have time for this right now can you give me a call next week or this isn't really my bag I'm very sorry then it does help to get people to just in that crunch moment when you desperately need mm -hmm. to get a comment on something they will help you out if you've been decent to them it all comes back to it's you. It's what goes around comes <laughs> around. Exactly, exactly. Katie, thank you so much. This has been great. I really enjoyed our conversation. And now uh, a bit of a different thing that we do in this podcast, our question time with our two young students here, two young ladies. And I got Irna and Shivangi here. Irna, over to you. Uh, introduce yourself and, of course, ask your question to Katie. Hi, my name is Hirna Trivedi. I'm from India and I recently came to the UK to pursue my master's in multimedia journalism. And my question to you, Katie, is that uh, the cost of living crisis has been worse than ever now. And this has specifically affected the students, more so the international students. And recently, a survey by The Guardian said that students are skipping meals just to save on money. And they're working more hours, which is decreasing their time to focus on the studies. So do you think this situation in the UK is actually going to discourage students from other countries to pursue their studies in the UK? God, I hope not. I hope that people keep coming here to, to study and, and to live and to work and everything else. The cost of living crisis has actually been a really big moment for financial journalism in the UK. I know that's not the most important thing around it. Students actually going hungry is much more important than that. But... This has been a real moment where it has been incumbent, incumbent on newspapers like the Financial Times to really turn inflation, which is quite an abstract idea, into a cost of living crisis. So you can think about inflation as much as you like. It's numbers, they go up, they go down. As soon as you can't afford your dinner or afford to pay your gas bill, all of a sudden it kind of comes home to you. And it's been a real realisation, I think, for us as well, that this is what we're actually talking about. We're talking about people's ability to make ends meet. That's what inflation really is. And, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why we've been pouring so much effort into trying to write about this in the most accessible way that, that we can. The... Bad news, in a sense, is that, you know, there was this idea that inflation had kind of reared up after the after the COVID pandemic and after all the lockdowns finished. And there was this idea that it's OK. The central banks have got this. They're like jacking up interest rates at a record breaking pace and inflation is going to come back down again. Central bankers thought this. Professional investors thought this. On some level, I'm sure I thought this. Wrong, wrong, wrong. And it turns out that inflation is a much more difficult thing to gain mastery over than anyone had imagined. So um, it's going to take really quite a lot of effort to get this back down. And the difficulty that central bankers have is how can they pull this inflation rate down without putting lots of people out of work 
or without breaking the financial system. So this is very much where we're at now. Bringing inflation down is really hard, in particular bringing food price inflation down. It's running at close to 20% in the UK. It is is really hard. I, I think, you know, anyone with a kind of empathetic bone in their body can see that this is really tough on people on low incomes, on students, on, on people who are trying to work three jobs to make, make ends meet. Um, governments can see this. So... I don't have an answer. If I could just pull the number down, I would. But um, but it's very, very tough out there. And that's what we're trying to help people to understand. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Irna. Shivangi, over to you. Hi. Uh, so I'm Shivangi Sen. Even I'm from India and I came here to pursue my master's in multimedia journalism from the University of Westminster. It's a great opportunity being here. <laughs> so uh, my question to you is a recent NCTJ study uh, said that there has been a sharp drop in the number of women journalists in the UK in the past couple of years. Uh, in 2020, there were around 53% uh, journalists who were women, which was more than the number of men. But in the recent study, which is the data from 2022, uh, only 41% of the journalists are women. So that's like a 12 point drop in a span of just two years, which is quite concerning and alarming. So what do you think could be the factors contributing towards women backing out of journalism in the past couple of years? Yeah, I think that that statistic is really kind of alarming. And um, it, it doesn't square with my personal experience, which doesn't mean to say that that it's wrong. I think um my guesstimate on this is that it has something to do with COVID, right? There's a lot of people who have moved out of the big cities after, you know, this work from home revolution. The cost of childcare is just astronomical. It's incredibly difficult to justify taking a journalist salary. You know, no one goes into this business for money. So I imagine there's quite a few women that have just dropped out of out of the, the profession partly for that reason. But but I am totally like guessing here. Um, I know there's lots that there is a kind of there are certain parts of London where there's a kind of lack of school age children because people have just said, forget it, I'm out of here. I can't afford this rent and all the rest of it. What I will say is the commitment on Newsroom to increasing the representation of women and people of colour and disabled people and whatever it is, is entirely genuine. You know, the the industry is not paying lip service to this. It takes it incredibly seriously. You know, every time you talk to senior people in, in newsrooms, you know, whether it's the FT or anywhere else, then increasing diversity and representation is absolutely top of their list, top of their priorities. And this is where I, what we are here for as well as FT Talent. And we're really trying to bring new people uh, to the FT and uh, to uh, this kind of experiences as well to really make you see how accessible it can be if we find the good ways of, uh, you know, involving uh, people from the most diverse backgrounds and the communities. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you so much again, Katie. And thank you, ladies, for joining us. Bye. Thank you. We have a new experiment coming here at the Financial Times. It is the FT School of Journalism. This upcoming Thursday, we have a class with Dan McCrum that you have listened to on this podcast that is going to give you all the insights and secrets behind how to be an investigative journalist and reporter so that you can find everything on FT.com and FT Talent. Thank you so much and I can't wait for the next episode. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent team, Aya Al-Shihabi, and me, Virginia Stani. Our podcast producer, editor, and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa, and our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time, and keep listening. Keep listening.